thank you all for uh, being here and all you do for our state. Um, an, an, an advocate, a, a mother, a, 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 a citizen like myself went before the International Code Council a couple years ago and started a conversation about the lack of restroom access for so many disabled Americans. Um, uh, they took their voice and uh, with that voice was uh, people like mine, me, me and my family and my friend Barbie here who uh, have, a, have a loved one that requires Anyway, um, for just a backup history, that then that uh, that proposal it hadn't even been adopted yet. I, I gave that to the city of Oklahoma City and David, as, or Mr. Adcock, as you were working there at the time, got the prize. And <clears throat> I know that a lot of people have had their eyes on this and thought about this. And they're in the process of getting an adult plus changing table put in at the Will Rogers World Airport. Um, we were the 14th airport in, in, in the nation to put in that table. And before that, uh, people were changing their loved ones in the terminals and on the floor in the bathrooms and letting them sit in the soil uh, until they got back to the hotel or their home or wherever they were going. And to this day, I can travel across this country and not have restroom access to my kid in airports, but we have service animal relief areas and federal regulations where service animals have uh, places and our, all of our tourism centers have dog parks and um, there's been no real thoughtful planning since 1990 for people like my son and I as his caregiver. So uh, it's, it's really important work and to, to see how many people have come together and really thought about this and we're fighting systemic ableism and a, a whole few decades of just lack of planning and a whole bunch of tired caregivers that haven't had the energy or the resources to stand and fight for something like this. So. What I'm, I'm asking, uh, whenever I did, whenever I uh, submitted my public comment for the, the, the code change, it was before um, Oklahoma City had adopted what they have, and Scott probably knows a whole lot more about what changes are, uh, the detail of this, the, the, the differences here, but uh, one thing that is really important to me is that at the very bottom you'll see facilities located in areas servicing serving outdoor uses such as but not limited to public parks which are accessible to the public outside of normal operational hours are permitted to install stationary non-adjustable changing tables at the surface height of 17 to 19 inches. So at Scissor Tail Park when we in here in Oklahoma City when voters approved um, all the funding for Scissor Tail Park we were able to add an adult size changing table to the to the south end of the park, and that table is placed at the, at the height of a baby changing table. And Max weighs 95 pounds. And you know, Mr. Adcock, if I were your caregiver, I, I would not be able to lift you up that high. So the, the transfer height is important whenever you're not dealing with a height adjustable one. For example, like at a city park, um, Max is able to transfer on his own. And some people aren't, like uh, Sarah, Barbie's daughter, is very high support and needs and has been able to transfer on her own. But so Darby doesn't have to lift her, she can just maneuver her and scoot her over to that. And then bend, we bend over more. That's the whole point of an adult size changing an adult a, a height adjustable one. So um, uh, I, I'm six foot one and you know to have a table up here, well that's almost as tall as Barbie. She's a really good friend of mine and 70 years old and a caregiver an adult child and her, what she needs and what I need are very different, uh, but our children are about the same size. So um, in a public park, you know, I, uh, we had the Oklahoma City Planning guy, uh, I can't think of his name right now, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to throw a blank, but he told me, it's like, if we have, if we have sheetrock walls, we need an adult size changing table that's high adjustable, and if those walls are made of cinder block, like at a park, uh, those, those, those rooms, used a lot by the public. When mirrors are broken, just vandalism at a park is more common than someone coming into a facility like this. So I think it's important that whenever we build any park, whether it's a state park, city park, and even our national park, this is what I've given the United States Access Board for them to consider for updating our ADA standards for accessible design. And to have 
have so much work come out of Oklahoma City and to have uh, what I'm hoping is unanimous consent from this committee that we all believe that my son and Sarah and other disabled Americans all across this country and their caregivers um, are thoughtfully planned for. And I believe this aligns with what my son's federal rights to restroom are, whether it's in a park or in a Title II or three building. And we've even gone beyond this. So going into the size of the building and what its intended use is. Whenever I go to Sam's Club, Sam's Club, they've looked at several of their stores, and there's only one store in, their, in this whole city that's even accommodated an adult restroom table, and that's one on the South May. But nobody at Sam's Club wants to know that my, I'm keeping Max at home from coming in there and shopping, or that I'm forced to change him out in my car in their parking lot. Nobody, no big manager, no uh, CEO of any company uh, would, would want that over a, a $2,500 table. So it, it, um, Scott could probably go into the uh, details, and you all probably, if you have time to look at it, could, could see the details. But um, I, I noticed another big one here is, so when we're talking about security checkpoints, so at the Attorney General's office, there is a, uh, when the public vis visits that building, there's not a, there's not a public restroom that's accessible unless you go through a checkpoint. So similar like if we were to go to the airport, there are restrooms past TSA and where the adult size changing table is there, right? So what's at the Will Rogers Old Airport right now is what I consider a temporary and reasonable accommodation because at the time that table was installed and even as we were um, building that terminal, um, um, we, we, we weren't thinking about that, 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 that gate, so we have policies in place now. So everyone at Will Rogers World Airport that works there should be aware of that table and the policy. So whenever I'm traveling or someone, I'm dropping somebody off to go travel and I have Max with me, and I should be able to go to anybody in that airport and say I have a, a child here that needs access to the restroom at the Universal Adult Size Changing Table, and they should know right away what the policies are in that airport. So I don't have to go through person for in out. Sometimes it's you never get anywhere with anybody. Um, even uh, five years, I've been asking the Oklahoma State Department of Education for something that they refused to give me for him. They refuse it. <clears throat> anyway, so when we're looking at checkpoints, and the Bell Isle Library has a checkpoint, where they decide even after that library was renovated, you have to go and ask for a key to the room it's in because there's a gate that's down. It's you have to get a key to the gate that's down in the basement. And over here at the Ron North Library, they put it in a work, in an employee work space that was converted to a nursing mother's room, an adult, and a, and a caregiver room, but that's on the second floor, and only employees are allowed on the second floor at the, at the library over there. So that's a checkpoint. <clears throat> so where these adult size changing tables are provided in separate rooms or in addition to the maximum fixture requirement as listed where in the code these rooms shall be from, uh, permitted to be locked during normal hours, right? Those are behind temporary accommodations. So when we're building these buildings, if we're going to build a, a uh, family restroom that services all of those needs in new structures, Where would there be a locked door in a new structure? So this is, I think this is uh, pertaining to those who have put in temporary accommodations, right? Because we're talking about the PACOM Center. <clears throat> the PACOM Center has temporary and reasonable accommodations when the leadership has, has refused to convert one of those bathrooms and just put an adult size changing table and you have to go to the med clinic and bring your attention that you need assistance, temporary for these accommodations to use the, the, it's actually a therapy table at the PACOM Center right now. They haven't even purchased a, a $2,800 table to replace the therapy table there. But it's still a temporary and reasonable accommodation what they have now. But I would consider that another checkpoint because you're going to a med clinic, right? You're having to ask permission to go past a certain point to do a certain thing. So Oklahoma City Community College put in a, a table in their women's restroom and 
what are the policies on whenever that's a, that's a temporary and reasonable accommodation that they've made, but because that building is a fairly new building within the last 10 years, you have the women's restroom and the men's restroom, and so I'm just using you as, as my example, Mr. Adcroft, if you were with me at the Oklahoma City uh, Community College, I would need to clear the restroom. And is there a policy in place in that school for someone to help me, right? So it makes it this, adopting this as our building standards also comes with a lot of this, uh, what temporary accommodations are in place and um, policy is so very important. To make sure that and staff that aren't trained on disability etiquette and awareness and just basic human need think of these things if we're not, never presented to us, but um, I'm unintentionally, my son and I are unintentionally discriminated against almost every new building we go to where I don't know where he has restroom access in. And it's a huge, it's a conversation that needs to get started it, it, that we have an opportunity in, in Oklahoma to be first at something. Uh, Oklahoma City is already first in the world worked really hard to come around and um, right now Oklahoma City has adopted this standard and it's, it's more in line with my son's federal rights than anything I've ever seen and I've looked at Australia's uh, building codes and the um, United Kingdom so does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? I don't have any questions, but I can go through the section. There's some, some details and changes here we need to discuss, of course. Okay. Um, but yeah, Oklahoma City, we, we wrote this. Uh, of course, this was written before the 2018 code. Uh, you'll notice that 2024 has adult changing station language in the in the written text already. So there's a few sections here that, you know, on the motion we, we just strike through and, and revert to the code. But there are the exceptions and things like that that we wrote in. Uh, there's also the dimensions of the room and some other things we we'll probably want to go over real quick. Um, this is a, an upcoming issue. Like I said, they did put it in the 2024 code for the first time. When I wrote this with my staff, uh, you know, the 2024 wasn't out yet. Uh, I based this off of preliminary proposals that had been sent to the ICC at the time. So certain things have been changed, but overall what they've got in here is a good base. <laughs> we just want to pass certain aspects here that I'd, I'd like to point out. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it, this is a problem, <coughs> uh, a need that's gonna be, uh, you know, more and more necessary as we go forward. Uh, I think last I heard was it one in 20 children are born with, you know, autism or some other form of, uh, you know, handicap, we believe, physically. Uh, this is not something that's gonna be going away anytime soon. It's, it's gonna you know, be more and more necessary. So this is, this is what this is about. Um, so the, the primary differences in hey, this. Scott, what that in for me, please? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, chapter 11, 1110.4. 11, and uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, it looks like she's updated it here in your, in your uh, pamphlet, but 1110.4. Uh, so, so really, 1110.4, 1110.4.1, 1, all of that, I, I'd like to just scratch our language and revert to what they have in the code. But I'd like to keep the exception under 1110.4.1. Uh, the IBC does not have that exception. So the exception is uh, where a building is provided with more than one family or assisted toilet bedding rooms, only one such room shall require the universal changing station. Uh, where this exception is utilized, signs should be provided at all such rooms indicating the location of the universal changing station. And we have to make sure we have at least one. Uh, existing structures are permitted to comply with this with this section to the greatest extent possible. I've allowed for the uh, 24 IEDC. Um, I don't recall if we passed any language in the IEDC on this yet or anything. We have that. not listed any standards okay. on that. Okay. We can go back to that code. We might, yeah, I'll have to double check on that as well. Uh, but so those two exceptions are not in the code. Everything above that is currently there. Um, the 1110.4.2 is in the code in the 2024 text, but uh, well, sorry. Um, but they did not go into near as much detail. So I'd like to I'd like to keep our proposal for the 
Uh, we mentioned the room sizes, eight by 10. Uh, this will be slightly, slightly larger than your typical family rep changing restroom, uh, maybe by about a foot in each dimension. Uh, you know, most family, family restrooms get pretty close, but uh, the, the point here, of course, is to make sure you have enough room for maneuvering around the adult changing station, uh, getting to it, transferring somebody off, maybe off a wheelchair or if they're, you know, they come in walking. Um, you know, of course, the, the restroom, the uh, adult changing station area has to have a, uh, must have, have its own toilet, has to have its own sink, has to have its own trash dispenser uh, or receptacle. Uh, so there's, there's a need for, for additional room there. Most family restrooms will get pretty close. So the only difference is probably going to be about a foot in each direction, you know, foot in width, foot in many ways. Um, with the maneuvering clearances and all that we added here, they don't talk about any of that in the code on which they have in the ICC. Um, the exception, it looks like the exception they have under 1110.4.2 should be more or less what we have here, so I'd, I'd rather just revert that exception to the IPC. Um, the, reference we have to 1110.4.3. I'll probably just revert back to the code on that, but we would want to keep the exception as proposed. Uh, the proposed location, so the exception says, uh, where adult changing stations are provided in separate rooms, and in addition to the minimum fixture requirements that are listed elsewhere by the code, you know, if they're going above and beyond, said room should be permitted to be locked during normal operation, normal hours of operation where access may be granted to the request of staff and informational signage is posted on the door to the facility. This exception shall not apply to those rooms otherwise required by or used in combination with this code to provide for family or assisted use, uh, nor shall be interrupted, uh, interpreted to allow for such facilities to be locked where other single multi-user or family restrooms are not. The point is, we, you know, we can't discriminate, we can't lock this one and leave all the other restrooms open, right? Uh, but also part of this is there, there are certain scenarios in which you don't have maybe much foot traffic um, it could be a museum, something else. Uh, we, we dealt with this one with our own Oklahoma City Parks Department. They will worry about vandalism. They have had similar type uh, facilities ripped out and sold off by whoever in the middle of the night. So places that don't have much foot traffic, they don't have many eyeballs on them. Uh, you know, we, we do have some concerns about being able to lock those, make sure somebody's not going in there. These, these tables are anywhere from $2,500 on up. Uh, they have to lift and lower and they have to hold a certain amount of weight. So they're, they're not cheap. And uh, you know, it is something that, that has been vandalized in the past in other scenarios. So that, that's the reason for that exception. We wanted to give at least a little bit of an option there due to security concerns. Um, so we'd like to keep that exception. And then 1110.4.4, uh, I'd like to revert that paragraph back to the IBC as well. So I'd like to strike that. Uh, however, the 1110.4.5, is new because the IBC does not go into the details of what these changing stations actually have to be. How large, how much weight they have to hold, uh, how lower they have to, how low they have to go, how high they have to raise. They don't discuss that at all. Um, I haven't had a chance since the 24 came out to verify if some of the things in the ICC ANSI. They could have put something there, I really don't know. Um, but like I said, that's the reason for this last uh, section here about the changing table services. Uh, the adjustable height, um, through all the research that we did, there's quite a few companies out there that provide these, produce these. Um, however, there's, there's it, it, some of the dimensions, some of the heights that they have to, to lower down to, uh, became fairly rare, uh, almost impossible to find. So we, we tried to find uh, heights and dimensions that were within reason across the market, uh, and these were what we came up with. Uh, so changing table surface, minimum 24 by 70, typical size for a adult human being. Uh, table surface must be adjustable to allow lowering to a height of 18 inches or less. Uh, you know, some individuals, uh, whether it be adult or child, may not be able to climb up onto a already raised surface. You have to lower this down to a point where they can, you know, ease onto it or, you know, however they have to do. Uh, and of course, to a height, uh, to a raised height of no less than 34. Of course, that just gets back to the accessible height, you know, countertops and so forth, if I recall. Uh, 
Uh, change of fuel surface must be capable of supporting 350 pounds. Uh, we wanted to make sure that's in there. That is uh, something that is, is found out in the market uh, through a reasonable amount of options. Um, the exception there, facilities located in areas serving outdoor uses, such as an elementary view public parks, uh, which are not are accessible to the public outside normal operation or hours, are permitted to install stationary, non-adjustable change of pedals <coughs> in the surface size between 17 and 19 inches. Uh, again, this gets back kind of to our parks and things like that, places that are, you know, it, it may be just a, a service station or it could be kind of like a travel station in a sense. I, I, you may have various scenarios. There's no security. Nobody's out there. You're there alone. Maybe you've got access in the middle of the night and again, it gets back to vandalism. So uh, that's one thing our own parks department is doing. They're putting in uh, more, more or less kind of a concrete uh, or, or hard top, you know, wood or whatever else. Something that's stationary that's that's more or less indestructible uh, that, that would have little value of pulling out the resource. So uh, that's the reason for that exception. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's the that's the details. Uh, we've passed this bill from the city here uh, recently, in the last few months. But it's, this is something we wrote up and have been working on for two and a half years. So and it's been a lot of good work, Bob, and yeah. I'm really proud of everybody that's served on this. Yeah, uh, Craig, you get yeah I just had a couple comments. So. We were the contractor that installed the um, the dull stick changing station at the airport, um, and that cost twenty thousand dollars. Just the just the cost to, to change it, you know, change it out, and they're already talking about they're going to have to redo it, and because it didn't quite meet the rules, and so these have a serious cost to them, um, and so I'm not saying that that's a something that we shouldn't do. But that's and that's just the cost to renovate it. You know, that, that doesn't. That there's cost for the real estate, the building. Um, these are very, very expensive. Um, and so, I think in very large settings like the Paycom Center, where you've got tens of thousands of people, I think is a very appropriate place to do that. But I think it's a tall order to require maybe Sands to have these or something. I think that's a pretty. So pretty um, onerous requirement, question. and so I just I think that, like I said, I'm not saying that we should say no. I'm just saying that there are serious cost implications that need to be considered. Um, you know, for for example, um, back in the day, they made a requirement for all public pools to have wheelchair ADA accessible, and a lot of municipalities and small hotels, they just said, forget it. We can't. We're not going to do it. We're just going to shut the pool down. That's, so we don't want to penalize the smaller guys, you know, for for this situation. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. It needs to be considered. So, so can I let, well, let me clarify here real quick too, oh. and then if you don't mind. So uh, one thing to keep in mind here in the code itself right now, uh, as written by the ICC, uh, eleven ten point four point one, where required, uh, these are only required in assembly and working fill occupancies uh, where a family or assisted room or bedroom is required already. Okay. So that's going to mean, um, I think that comes out to roughly an occupant load of at least 300 or more uh, before you get to the six or the, uh, what did I say, six or more? Exactly. Right? I think that's where it is. It's more or less when the family restroom kicks in, which should be at six or more uh, uh, units. But um, the other three uh, reasons here, the other three scenarios would be uh, fee occupancies. So uh, facilities for students above 12th grade, universities, places like that, uh, where they have uh, an aggregate of 12 or more male and female water closets are required. So again, if you get to a larger occupant load of it as well there, um, 12 or more in a, in a B use, uh, I think how many that would be, that would be quite a bit as far as occupant load. Uh, and the next one is group E occupancies for schools, uh, uh, where a room or space used for assembly purposes requires an aggregate again of six or more male and female water clusters. Again, we get back to that 300 octave load minimum. Um, and then the last one is the highway rest, stop, rest stops and highway service pauses. Uh, of course, again, that, that kind of speaks for itself. So yes, those may be smaller, but uh, you know, again, you're on a four hour trip or more, uh, where you're gonna stop, where you're gonna eat, you know, where you find that access. So I just wanted to clarify that and then of course we can move on to the discussion. So, so. I have a question. This one exception for existing structures are permitted to uh, comply with this section to the greatest extent possible. Okay. 
the existing building code addresses this by saying fine. that if you're doing alterations, additions, and stuff of that nature, adult changing stations shall be installed in accordance with the letter P and the IBC. So is there a reason we need that exception in there? Well, so we can have that argument. The the only the only difference then it sounds like would be the language, you know, greatest extent possible. Well, that, that's already is that even it is technically infeasible to meet some of the ADA requirements. Or right. technically infeasible, it, it ain't a cost issue. It's basically yeah. you can't do it. Okay. Well, I'm there, willing to exception strike exception to, to the ADA that. stuff. Yeah. In the existing building code. Okay. Well, that sounds like we need to strike exception two under 1110.4.1 to revert to that language. And then if you wanted to revert uh, 1110.4 back to the code language, we cannot do that if you add section 1110.4.5. Uh, well, sorry, just that first sentence under the heading. What do you, what do you want to call that? I, I personally don't have any issues. Uh, I think it would be cleaner if you redid it revised the comment form and brought it in exactly how you wanted it mm -hmm. to be okay. instead of trying to mark up this yeah. one and make sure we get it right okay. so uh, i would like to get a consensus from everybody how they would like to go with this so mm -hmm. she won't have to come back to our next meeting i'll come back forward. if i need to i mean well, karen one one thing to look at i just found it in the 2017 ANSI. Mm -hmm. uh it's in supplement one uh and it has the changing table surface, um, it has all of that in it, and it's even more. Uh, it, it, it requires it to go lower, it requires it to support more, it requires it to be bigger. Okay, right. Uh, so we may go deeper in that language too, you're right. Okay. Yeah, our consensus is pending approval for the 23 version of 2017. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I'd like to come back to Brad Lantham and saying that it was that. Uh, taxpayers spent $20,000 on that table at the airport. That same table that was installed at the airport was installed at Bethany Children's Hospital. And it's a $5,600 table. And it was mounted to a wall. So I would like for you to provide the, if it was your small business that installed that and charged the airport $20,000. That room, no, I'm talking, that room is big enough to accommodate a freestanding $2,800 table that's similar to what the Oklahoma City Convention Center, the Oklahoma City Zoo, the <coughs> Science Museum of Oklahoma. It's a uh, cost plus contract, so I'll be happy to show my backup documentation, which is well proven out. We have the electrical upgrades, there was uh, architectural upgrades to, to the room. It's not just provided to you. I would like to know why that table was chosen over a freestanding one, when a freestanding one should have been installed there in that room. Uh, and that was a, that's a, if, if the Oklahoma City Zoo and the Oklahoma City Convention Center and the Ron Morris Library, if they can all do it for under 5,000, I'd like to know why we spent 20,000 with your contract, with your, you and then there was never even a trash can put in the room. Take that up and with the city, Oklahoma City Airport Trust. We just installed what they told us to install. Okay, well there could have been a better solution there and saved us money. They chose to reinforce the wall in a room that could have accommodated one that is just literally dropped in and it's a plug drop. So for you to say that the cost, you were, you were emphasizing $20,000 of the cost of these when I'm directed to the floor in the bathroom in public facilities, even at Sam. So I wanted to clarify your, I would like, I would, I'm personally going to ask for those records now because I want to know how much we spent on that and how much your company was paid to do that. Because I'm curious now because I've seen all the cost records on all these other projects and even the killing of the Capitol only cost us $10,000 in that table. That table was one of the nicer ones because we're in a really nice building, right? OMEX gave me a report of $12,000 for that table installed and they had to do the exact same thing. So I'd like a public records request on that. So I see, these, I see the comment about public parks how is that included in the list of the four occupancies? Is that included under visitor centers? 
No, it's actually exception down below at the very end of what I've submitted for Oklahoma City, what Oklahoma City yeah. adopted. It's, it's, so it's not limited to public parks, but where's yeah. public parks limited? Well, public parks you could have. Where would you require them? So you go to like Osage State yeah. Park, or you go to uh, an Enid, Salt Plain State Park, they have probably, for a tent camp, they probably have a cumulative of four mm -hmm. restrooms. Is it because parks are under an assembly occupancy? How are we getting, how are we looping it, in parks? More, more or less. I mean, it, we, we had to leave it open to some of these different scenarios uh, that we might not have seen now, but the parks did have a scenario in which they have some form of outdoor amphitheater or some, some assembly type space. They've got restroom structures built on site standalone, but you know, they don't have security. And of course, these but are- But they, they wouldn't have six or more. They would just have two, probably in that instance. Well, some of them, I mean, if you, if you think of like the zoo amphitheater, you know, outdoor amphitheater, things like that, you know, yeah, they may have quite a few restrooms and, and those are facilities that, you know, they're like our scissors Hill Park downtown here or, or other other locations. They may be left, you know, free and open after hours, after the concerts. Or they're, 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 well, my concern is, I, like, I, I visited several state parks in the last couple months and I think the state parks for like tent camping would actually be naturally excluded from this. And I think they need to be included in this. Because if you go to, like I said, Salt Plain, Osage State Park, Robert Cave State Park, whatever, and you want a tent camp or RV camp, mm -hmm. we, we have all those beautiful new state provided restrooms installed, they're great. But you would think you'd want at least one of these per state park. There's only 33 state parks. Mm -hmm. when we, we went out to Roanoke State Park with Mayor World Boy Scout family. My husband's a third generation Eagle. I'm yeah. raising three Eagles. And when we camp out there, I had to change my son in a, in, a, in a parking lot full of all of these Boy Scouts camping because, and Matt Pinnell, he knew when the, our parks were being renovated, our, government, our state government knew as we were spending all those millions of dollars renovating our restroom pavilions and our parks, that we were, we were renovating them as a barrier in place. Yeah. And so the, the, the restroom pavilions at um, Romano State Park do not accommodate an adult size changing table you would have to move cinder block walls. So this is for any new, if we go in and renovate our new parks, because I know, I, I mean, I- That's what I'm saying, I don't know if the language includes the parks, though. It needs to include the parks. Well, it, the, the language in the code and in the supplement does not require the parks to provide an adult changing station, right. unless they have, you know, one of these assembly type uses that would, that would require due to the number of, of seats. But parks outright by themselves would not require a changing station. I think we should include that. Because, I mean, I, I get the point. It's like, by we're, this kicks in an aggregate of six or more restrooms, right? You don't want one of these small mercantile uh, businesses on 23rd Street that would require this, because they don't even have a, yeah. a restroom, maybe, let alone a really a public restroom. But if you're going to a state park, I mean, you're isolated. Uh, otherwise, the individuals can be, have to be changed on the floor. There's Tents involved. It, the changing it's one thing to change a toddler or a baby in your own tent on the floor, but when you're dealing with something that's 130 pounds, you know it's way more cumbersome. And you would think the accessibility would be more needed. So I would, I'm in favor, and I, I don't know if this is a, a bad idea as far as it actually getting final approval. I would be in favor of requiring um, the state parks, each state park, to have one of these, either mm -hmm. retrofitted, not necessarily, yeah. or new going forward, not necessarily, you know, I could, I could write that in here as a separate line item. So like, you, you know, occupancy you number five? Separately just in case. Yeah, because you're, when you're in uh, Salt Plains State Park, I mean, where else would you go? You're pretty isolated, they, or Black Mesa State Park. The, the point is you're isolated. Well, and then you have to look at what state laws are in place about indecent exposure and uh, how uh, when people aren't aware of one's federal rights. I was arrested at the Oklahoma State Department of Education the other day. I don't know if y'all know that, but I had been asking for five years to, for state troopers to stop directing me, me, to the floor and restroom and uh, demanding my son's federal rights be acknowledged in the state building, and it got me arrested. So if I'm at a state park and I have, let's say, my friend Ren here is a 14-year-old boy, well, Max will be 14 one day, and if I have Max in the back of my truck or in the back of my van with his pants off, half naked, and I get someone like Trooper Beatty that comes by, uh, I'm pretty sure he's probably not gonna think about my son's federal rights, the barrier in place, the accommodations that I've been asking for for half a decade now, and it's totally ignored by our legislature. 
there's all these things. Well, then I'm, I'm afraid it, it causes isolation in society. I feel like I have to stay at home a lot and my son has to stay at home a lot or, or we have to mentally prepare ourselves for being discriminated out in public and, and a whole bunch of the public not trained or aware of disability etiquette and all the barriers in place, right? So what are the, what are the laws on, um, on having your pants off in a parking lot in our state owned buildings versus allowing or providing reasonable accommodations and up to these building standards that align with my son's and Sarah's federal rights at a state park. And you're talking about a cement bench. So I have pictures uh, of what the brand new, the concrete was white when we visited there, brand new. And I'm sitting outside my van with the whole boys clubs around my, with my van parked in a way to shield him basically, but I have him half naked in the parking lot in front of brand new restroom pavilions as our government knew the barrier was going, was there as they were putting them in. With, because we don't have standards to go by and contractors aren't up to date with, you know, what families like mine really go through. Sharon, I had to ask Sharon Carney one time at the airport. I said, he doesn't have legs. She says, I've never have been, no, no one's ever brought this to my attention. Keith Wilkinson, ADA coordinator of Oklahoma City, he's like, I've done this for a long time and no one has ever brought this to my attention. Uh, this is kind of a sign that there's a lot of shame involved. There's a lot, it's what you do in a restroom is very private and it's not something that we just normally come up here and say, hey, my son was born with a spinal cord injury and his sphincter muscle doesn't work and so he's a little weak his whole life. And there's nothing wrong with that. The adult, uh, uh, Pat, if you go into, next time you go into Walmart or Target, just look at how much real estate those adult diapers take up. It takes up like five times more room than feminine hygiene products. So, it's a convert, they call it toilet taboo. We don't want to talk about what we do in the bathroom. We don't want to talk about what other people do in the bathroom. And when we start talking about making people uncomfortable because we're addressing our own ableism and bias about disabled people and their abilities. He can do anything. My, my, my son can do anything anyone else can do. He can play tennis. Okay, he can play football, he can play basketball, all from his chair. And he has, he needs to be planned for in society. He goes to school in a charter school in downtown Oklahoma City, or his, his two older brothers are going to the downtown library, they're going to the Myriad Gardens, I had to file an ADA grievance on the Myriad Gardens and Cedar Hill Park because leadership over there was refusing, refusing to do what they needed him to do. And I had to call and force them to do that. Shouldn't have to force anybody at this point in this juncture. He knows someone who can leave the rest of the floor in the bathroom and say we can stop it, right? Like parks. I have a 41 year old brother who has cerebral palsy and he's so overweight now. It's not, it's also dangerous too, trying to change somebody to get slippery. And honestly, I've never even thought about this. And I have the same family situation where I've changed him, helped change him on a floor, but he's so heavy now. And since he has cerebral palsy, he's, he has no use of his legs. Yeah not no longer and so it's it's really cumbersome too it took three guys you know two to hold one to change yeah and and then you're trying not to slip and, and fall have you ever uh, so have I, you ever seen a real place changing table or how uh no and honestly how easy you know, it makes I, the process I didn't even i've never thought about it i didn't think about it either until i was yeah. at the children's hospital when he was a baby and i was capping him I, and that's just to be capped every three and a half hours and they told me to just use a, 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 a couch out in the waiting room. And as I'm capping my son and everyone looking around at me don't understand what intermittent catheterization is and why it's needed for kidney health, bladder health, because nothing in his yeah. system works right. Uh, his kidneys function great and his, his bladder is the size of a walnut without medicine paralyzing it. Because right. it just constantly, right? So, uh, well, I support yeah. it. So we, we have no. said it, Scott, before so, you vote on this, or? The other thing to keep in mind is it's not just people that are born with disabilities. I have an uncle that got shot out of a car at 45 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing. Any of us could need this at any point in time. Right. Yeah. The disability community as outside of women is the largest minority group in, in, the, on the, in the world. And, it, it's something, and it's a group that we can all join at any moment. So I have a friend who's a kid running around on an ATV and uh, he's with a group of his buddies and he's turned over and he uh, works for Oklahoma City now in a, in a chair. He, he's still able to go and work and have a fulfilling life, but he has a spinal cord injury. And I don't know whether or not my friend has to 
uh, be catheterized or how long if he ever needed caregiver assistance during his rehabilitation, but I, I imagine he did. And uh, our spinal cord affects all kinds, and that could be from a, a car wreck or being shot by police officers. How many times have a, has, has a police officer in this country been shot on the line of duty? And are they allowed, are, aren't they supposed to be welcome at an airport or at Sam's to go get their food? And we have all these people in isolated and, and, and we decided, uh, we decided a long time ago that people were better off with community supports and staying at home with the supports needed, right? We really appreciate your time and the information because I think a lot of people don't have that information and, and clearly even people with own family members, it, it's something you don't think about until you're faced with it. So we really appreciate the insight. Uh, fortunately, the, the International Building Code has, has looked at this as well, finally. And I think that's what we need to do. Go ahead, thank you. Yes. Go ahead, Joe. And I'll, I'll rewrite this, because most of it looks like uh, the only discussion we'll have is a few of the exceptions, a few of the add-ons we had. And then put in. And looking at the ANSI mm -hmm. uh, supplement the governor's reviewing, mm -hmm. it takes care of mm -hmm. uh, attorney radiuses, access, which was going to dictate room sizes, I don't know whether 2023 and this is going to be approved. The way I understand the supplement will only affect once that happens. What, what is referenced by the 24 IBC? 17. So it won't matter if they adopt the supplement in the 23. Uh, well, that supplement was added to the 17. Yeah. Okay, so when the supplement is adopted into the 23, it will also be. That's the way I understand it because they added the supplement to the 17. Yeah, it says 2017. So once they adopt the supplement, okay, and as long as the supplement, when it's adopted into as, the. As a code official, I would look at that supplement because it's been added to them. But so that's going to review the supplement, make sure that uh, it, he might check and see if we're. If somebody has a contact that can find out from ICC when the yeah. when the uh, 20, 20, whatever it is, 23 ANSI is looking to be approved. And if we bring in written language, it's probably gonna make it match that supplement. You know, so Scott's gonna rework this and get it exactly the way we want it to amend the code. Since and most of the and I'll, I'll probably put that in as a second motion, yes, sure. just, to, just to give people a chance idea. to, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, uh, <laughs> she wants to know if we're gonna add uh, public parks, mm -hmm. like in there. Yeah, yeah that'll, I'll, that'll do as a separate motion, or a separate yeah. motion. Okay, yeah. The so, soon as, I've already started a conversation with Mario Damiani, he's a senior, uh, he's a senior, he has the longest name, but he's the senior, Civil Rights Attorney for the United States Access Board. Right. He's so, the one helping me get this table over here at our federal building. So this code, if it does get adopted, and if it goes all the way through the process and goes into our, our state codes, it's not retroactive on existing buildings. If they do al al alterations or additions, change occupancies, then it could be retroactive based off the existing building. I just want you to know that, that just think, even if it gets approved, it's not, not everybody, every building right. has to go back and put these in. That's right, and when we build and renovate old, right? That's right. If it, get, if it makes it through the process and gets approved and signed by the state legislature, then yes, it will be required. And I've asked the Attorney General, De uh, General uh, the Attorney General, Governor Drummond, to keep his eyes on this because there's been a whole lot of retaliation over there at the legislature. So we're gonna make sure that nobody's playing any more games over there about but whenever we, whenever, whenever uh, your committee or your, the council here adopts what they're going to propose to the 2025 legislature, the rules committee, I would like to have that as soon as possible so I can give it over to Mario Damiani with the United States Access Board. So our, our board is just an advisory committee, technical advisory committee. Okay. Our, our, what we decide will be presented to the OEDCC commission uh -huh. uh, once we're completed. They will have public comment also allowed at their commission level. Okay. And then they will make the final decision on what rules get amended and moved on through the legislative body. Is there any 
So that okay. that's probably yeah, you'll know well. Oh, I thought this committee. was the final meeting. I didn't no. know. So I'm, this is all. No, this meeting. this committee reviews the code and makes the okay. uh, recommendations to the commission. The commission votes to propose it to the legislature. Ah. So. Okay. But, uh, this is all new to me. Yeah. I'm just I'm trying my best. I'm doing my best. Yeah. So, so we can have that for our next meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so are we gonna meet here again and talk about the where he's changes? gonna he's gonna rewrite this to make the necessary changes to the 2024 IBC to okay. incorporate the stuff that you're looking to bring in and not changing the stuff we don't need to change mm -hmm. and bring it back to our next meeting. Uh, which should be the first Thursday of next month. Uh, I can't give you a time yet because we're getting ready to discuss our meeting times. So, uh, uh, Kathy will be able to let you know when that meeting is. Okay. Thank you so much. It's a life changing for so many, and they have an opportunity to be first at something. Yeah, well, thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else have any questions, concerns?